Hello and welcome to the Silver Tent Television. This is a Together We Rock program, which we've entitled How Trauma Shapes Us. Um, it's going to be an interesting conversation. So if I hand over without more ado to Diane, who is going to shepherd us or shepherdess us to wherever we're supposed to be speaking. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Nikki Mariana. So welcome everybody. Um, it's lovely to see so many people here already on this call. We've got some um, Silver Sisters who've joined us from Synergy and I know that there are some people joining us on Facebook Live. And please do feel free to put comments in the um, comments and you know ask questions and things um, and if you've got things that occur to you so that'd be great and we'll do our best to pick up those points at the end Sunday's going to be um, telling us what people are saying so that's great so just to start off um, just want to have a little bit of a, a chat around what is trauma so you know a bit of a definition how do we think about trauma what what, what is it you know we, we're talking about it and we kind of assume we know but it's always good to get a bit of a definition so um nikki mariana would you like to speak a bit about what your definition is of trauma yes um as you say there are many definitions and I think the best ones to start off with are the ones that are best known. Um, trauma is most often incurred from something that happened very, very suddenly. It's a shock. And our responses are either to push it away, fight it, get rid of it um, at any cost, or we just freeze. We don't know what to do, where to go, how to go, what to think. Our mind doesn't work. Our stomach sinks down rather. And we think, ah, oh, um, if I just stand here, perhaps nobody will notice me. And the other well-known response is you see trouble coming and you run like hell. And you keep running until quite possibly you can't run any further and you stop out of sheer exhaustion. That's what may cause the trauma, although there are other things that can cause it. And what we regard as trauma is the after effects of that. When our body is trying to Gain, regain some balance because we're in the extreme mode of being traumatized. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's a good start. I think that's given that probably a few of us something to think about, which is great. Um, so, um, Lucy or Nadia, would you like to go next? Okay, I'll go next. Um, trauma, in my experience with the regression therapy, trauma seems to be something um, akin to having a, a splinter deep in your flesh, which is causing pain. Um, and of course, in this case, it'll be emotional pain and it can be physical pain, it can get that far. Um, it causes pain and it's it's very deep and some traumas are so deep as in uh, past lives that they're they almost feel like they need surgery to get them out um, and even the anticipation of looking at a deep trauma some people call it shadow work or uh, it can be can be frightening in itself um, because it's kind of been something that's in the unconscious and it's hidden then it's grows into a monster um, but uh, it, it's for that I think the best thing is to change one's perspective on uh, digging deep 
when one is prompted often by uh, outer life just seeming not to go well all the time you know and you you end up asking yourself why me why does this keep happening to me um whether it's a panic attack or failed relationships or you know whatever um there is a process which requires deep digging deep digging um and it can be very deep it can be past lives um and it can be carried over many past lives and really the the way to i've found that really helps prepare oneself for that deep digging is to consider it as um gratitude like thank goodness now the time has come to take that thorn out get that splinter out um, because it's a bit like a thorn on the bottom of your foot deep into every step you take is painful every step you take through life is painful there's there's a, there's, there's discomfort so um it's really a joyful occasion to to decide to address the roots of trauma um it's like taking that splinter out and once the wound has healed um you can walk through life pain free okay so for me there are two different types of trauma there's a soft trauma and there's a hard trauma and the soft trauma is really the one that I that has mainly affected me and that I will um, just briefly explain. Soft trauma is what happens to us when we're born and how our education and our upbringing affects our lives and how that can then create an ongoing, uh, ongoing tensions and trauma within the body without us even realizing it because whatever happens to us, it's normal. And uh, because it's our parents who are there and um, if they are unkind and abusive or anything like that as a child, you can't run away. So um, it, eventually that sets a pattern for us and um, which then can create emotional issues, hang ups of all kinds and and uh, illness as well. And uh, for example, you know, it can affect our uh, self-confidence and um, our self-image. So when it's a soft trauma, it's like an underlying current. It's something that is going on, but the child is being brought up and doesn't realize that actually um, it, it uh, goes against um, the law of nature of being loved and being sheltered and uh, being secure. And then, um, you know, we have the heart trauma. It can happen uh, uh, through a shock impact, you know, like a car accident, that's a, a, a heart trauma. Um, and it can also leave uh, side effects. So it will affect your central nervous system, your fight, flight or freeze reflex. And, um, it, it can impact you in a similar way, but perhaps, you know, you may be able to shake it free, to shake it out of your system. So with the heart trauma, you, your body may well release it. Basically, the difference between the soft trauma and the heart trauma and the heart trauma can give you an instant impact, shock impact, where it will put you into a fight or flight uh, state. Um, whereas uh, with the um, soft trauma, it can cause you to go into a freeze pattern, which then has a lot of uh, physical side effects later on in life, usually. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, and that sounds like that's what Lucy was talking about there with the, with the insidious bit, you know, it's that kind of, you don't notice it, it's kind of under the radar and you're not conscious of what's going on. And I think that happens to a lot of, a lot of people um, in all sorts of ways, absolutely but, agree. But it also happens to, uh, to all mammals and, um, and the way that they rid the trauma from the body, they shake it free. It happens involuntarily. And this is one of the things that we as human beings being uh, highly sophisticated, we have learned to suppress. But if you take little children and they are subjected to fear of some kind, they will start to shake. And the whole purpose of that shaking is that um, it's releasing 
the trauma from the body in order to restore it back to its harmony. So this is why I feel so strongly about guiding people with it because my body has taught me how to release that, you know, through different incidents in my life. So traumatic situations always cause my body to shake. And it's only like later in my 50s that I found out that it's healthy to allow the body to shake. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you. So I don't know if anybody else here on the call wants to just quick a quick chip in there with any extras or yeah, Sunday. Um, there's something popping up for me um, that I can re-traumatise myself with my thoughts so I don't actually have to be in the setting, I just remember it and then I get all the sensations again and it's almost like I'm back in that setting again, re-traumatised, so that's my extra added bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else, any, any other little comments or thoughts there going through? Stevie? In addition to that, there's the, for me, there's the energetic trauma whereby I'm not thinking of anything at the time. My body goes into something and it is only later on. It comes, something will come to me in a dream or somebody will say and it's like, gosh, yes. But, but my energy system has already experienced a trauma, you know, or the shaking or the breath. And also you say about shaking in the body. Um, for me as well, I noticed that I can't scream. Um, um, and I think as well, the voice box shuts down as well with trauma. If we are silenced in any way, then it's, and so um, along with sh um, shaking, I'm trying to learn to scream, which doesn't please the neighbors, but there you are. <laughs> Maybe standing at the top of a cliff is a good one to do it. I, I know a friend used to do that when I lived in Scotland, um, which was great. She's just shouting out to the sea going, <laughs> Okay, so nice, nice thoughts there, interesting thoughts. And so let's see where we go now. So Nikki Mariana, and let's just have a hear a bit more from you. So just to introduce Nikki Mariana to those of you who've not met her so far in the tent or in synergy. So Nikki Mariana bring, intuitively brings balance to land and people through art, essences, sound and laughter. So I'm looking forward to discovering a bit more about how and why painting plays such a big role in your work, Mr. Mariana. Over to you. Thank you, Diane. Why is art related to trauma for me? I, I painted for many years and my style was very capturing the visual proportions of things so you could recognize it was a cup of tea or a bowl of something or an apple or a tree and gradually my work began to change and I had begun exhibiting as a single artist in a exhibition in, in a gallery in Crawley exhibition over a period of nine months one day a month my first solo exhibition, so I was very excited about it and did a huge amount of preparation. Um, then various family how, uh, events occurred. There was a death. My son got married and emigrated to New Zealand with his Kiwi born wife, which was fantastic and extremely exciting, but at the same time, devastating. And I thought I'd recovered pretty well. On my way to meet up with a friend, narrow country lanes, and my car wouldn't stop. I pushed the brake down as hard as I could, and it just kept going. And there was a little mini skip lorry the other side of the road and I was talking out loud and saying, I am not going to hit it. I am not, I am not, I refuse to hit this lorry. With which there was a bang. And I was sort of ricocheted and hit my head on the windscreen and... Anyway, I managed to stay 
conscious and aware of what was happening. I knew my hand was twisted under my shoulder. I knew my left foot was twisted. And the, the neighbors called the ambulance, they called the police. What, is there anyone I would like them to call? So I said, yes, please, could you call my friend and tell him that I'm not going to arrive on time? Anyway, they let me off without going to hospital because they tapped all over my chest to make sure there was nothing broken. What they didn't tap was my hand, my left hand, which was broken, but not severely broken. So anyway, my friend Blessing came and picked me up and um, I slept for three days and nights. He stayed around, bless him, because I was so bruised and battered, I could not move on my own. And of course, one of the main things with trauma is to drink plenty of water. So I was down in gallons of water, which meant I had to get up and pee regularly and I couldn't get out of the bed. So he would come and lift me up, take me into the toilet. Do you want me to wait? No, I can manage perfectly all right. Shut the door, out you go. <laughs> um, anyway, after three days, I was back at home and not on my feet, but my, one of my falconry apprentices came and walked my dog for me. I promised to see the doctor, so I did go to see the doctor. And the doctor said, well, I think you're all right, but you know, I'm, I'm quite good at looking all right when I'm not really. So that's what I wanted him to say. And then I proceeded to work to, how do I get movement back in my body? My left hand was swollen, so I just held it up and kept it up while I was sleeping. Well, I couldn't lie down. I sat in my bed and held my hand up the whole time because I knew if the body couldn't cope, my hand would go purple instead of just swollen. But all the time it was swollen, it was healing and being held securely. So after a little while, I thought, okay, well, I can just about move again. Can't really walk yet. Having learned Tai Chi and taught it for many years, I was aware of how energy moves in your body and how your focus is important. So I just imagined I was doing Tai Chi. So my muscles would remember how to do it. And then came the day where I really wanted to paint to express what had happened. And then I thought, actually, it'd be really interesting. I usually paint with my right hand. What happens if I paint with my left? So I put a canvas up and I decided to paint one side with my left hand, one with my right hand. And my brain was going, no, 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 left hand can't do this. No, left hand's doing it wrong. No, left hand's doing it the other way. Be quiet, brain. No, 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 left hand's like, shh, shh. So I managed one painting and it was fascinating the way the movements were similar, but different. I, I did paint them at the same time not one side and then the other side, literally at the same time, so that my mental focus could not be on one specific hand. It was about holding balance and allowing them both to express themselves. Then I progressed to painting on separate canvases, so one on my left and one on my right, squirt some paint on and let the brushes do the work. And then I thought, well, perhaps I can apply this to my feet. Okay, how do I do that? Well, in Tai Chi, you learn to balance on one foot and you learn to be able to move the other foot quite comfortably while you're well balanced. I couldn't balance at all. So I imagined I was doing Tai Chi and my body knew how to do that. And then I had two canvases on the floor, one by my right foot, one by my left and a flat thingy of paint so I could dip whichever foot I was using it into the paint and then move it over the canvas and then swap feet and do it with the other. Yes, I did fall over once or twice, but hey, I got up again and worked with it. And I was absolutely fascinated how different the paintings with both hands were to the paintings with both feet. 
And because I was so absorbed in what I was doing, I forgot to think, oh, ouch, 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 this hurts. My body was relaxed and my intention was clear. And that helped me recover enormously from the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, every other aspect of the trauma. I have continued with that painting and I've continued with that way of painting by not using my mind, by allowing whatever needs to be painted to be painted. And as the result, one of the paintings I've created is behind me. And I painted that after being involved in the, in a workshop with the energies of Ascended Master Lady Sarah, who is the Ascended Master for the Age of Aquarius, which we are just at the beginning of. Now that painting holds her energy and her energy is all about balance. Balance of the masculine and feminine, about oneness, about peace. And I am, I am selling prints of those paintings, that painting, if anybody would like one. The ones I've sold so far have been more than well received. Have I run out of time, Diane? You, you're almost out of time, Nikki Marin. That's great. I think uh, it's lovely. I think, you know, I, I love that painting behind you. I've seen it quite a few times now and, and I do love the energy. And each time I look at it, I see to something different and, you know, it's great to explore. Um, so just quickly, do you want to just finish off with talking just briefly about the type of ways that you help people now because obviously you have healed yourself or you you know you're on that journey of healing I think most of us are, it's a perpetual thing <laughs> um but uh you know t tell us just briefly about what what you do with people how, how do you help them now well as a simple example with that painting nowadays as we can't meet in person I would have that painting beside me on zoom and very often I will ask a client or a student just to focus on the color that draws them in the most. And then to dive deep into that color and allow that color to embrace them. And people have been on the most amazing journeys. Back to a past life, one in particular was to the love of her life that she's actually been searching for through the whole of this lifetime. And he met her and gave her his love and said, I am not incarnating during this lifetime to be with you. This is your opportunity to diversify, to learn more. And suddenly this, this longing and searching that she'd experienced ever since she was born had gone. Mm. Oh, that's beautiful. So that it may, it may be with a painting, it may be with a flower and vibrational essence. Yeah. Um, it's, it's whatever feels right for the person that I'm talking to at the time. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nikki Mariana, that's lovely. So just take a breath. And now if Lucy Jordan, um, so Lucy is an intuitive artist, spiritual regression therapist, and these um, both journey into the infinite worlds of the imagination. Sounds wonderful. Um, so regression therapy, deeply intuitive psycho-spiritual work, and it allows the client to transform the source of the trauma, which could be current life and or past lives. I'm intrigued. Tell us more, Lucy. <laughs> Hi. Well, that's an amazing segue, Nick and Mariana. The past life. Um story and and then into the regression therapy um yeah the good thing about regression therapy is that it goes to the source of um the trauma which could be a current life in utero or past life um because it seems that when the source of the trauma is um is acknowledged first of all um and then during the transform what we call the transformation process um, there are many 
tools and techniques, and this is where intuition comes in very strongly, ways to transform that trauma and empower the um, client. And then it's, it's as if every single thought process or, or emotional uh, process after that trauma is just kind of dissipates because a trauma, um, it affects every moment of your life or current life, past lives, if that trauma is re reignited, let's say, and it, it could be something random that happens out in the world or something that's said to you, or there's just a constant kind of niggling disharmony in the mind, in the, in the emotional body. Um, so when the source of the trauma is discovered and, and healed, then it kind of, it just, smooths out everything going forward. Um, and the great thing about the therapy is that it's, it's like a, the, the imagination is limitless. There's, there's, no, there's no end to the potential. We can, there can be trauma in the ancestral lines, which are handed on, you know, generation after generation. Um, and you can, the client can follow the, um, the memory lines, let's say, of, of their ancestors and go into their childhoods, into their lives. Um, it's not like the, the, we have to follow our exact own um, memories. We can actually borrow memories. We can, we can jump into the shoes of another and experience their, uh, their traumas to learn what, how it shaped them uh, to behave in the way that they do to us usually, you know, it's usually with um, when somebody has um, had a, had a, like a perpetrator, someone who's abused them or um, um, they've, they've been victimized by them. So, the so Lucy, Lucy, how did you come to actually study that in the first place? You know, what drew you to it? You know, was there a particular trauma in your, in your life that, that meant that you, you know, kind of followed that path or, or what happened? Uh, well, it, it all, yes, in a way, yes, it feels like my whole life has been a search for uh, resolving traumas which showed up physically, because um, that's what trauma eventually does, you know, it causes a disharmony, and then if we ignore the emotional, the mental, it finally shows up in the body as a, as a physical solid manifestation, like an in-your-face deal with this. And that's how it was with me. I got psoriasis when I was 23. Um, and that got me on a journey of, of self-discovery, self-inquiry. Um, and, and because I was so, so amazed at the transformation in me, um, I went on to train in, in the various kind of healing modalities that I came across. The first was spiritual healing in my late twenties and then vibrational medicine which is um, gem and flower essences. Um, and at the same time, I was developing my artwork. And then there was a period of my life where I was not doing any of that. Um, and in that period of my life was, was the greatest experience of trauma in a way, like the dark night of the soul, um, which went on for years. Um, and then actually one day I was just wanting to, to go, get back into my healing, but learn a new modality. And it, it was just like one of those random things that the universe does, which is just put something in front of you and you go, oh, yeah. Um, it was um, the, the, I was interested in hypnotherapy actually, but when I discovered um, the regression training, it was like all the light bulbs went off. Um, it was so, it's so much more than, than hypnotherapy. And it's, it's something that's absolutely suits me totally and I love it and I just the transformations are amazing now within the training was where I discovered uh, one of the one of the greatest traumas of um, my current life um, and that was at my birth so you, as we were saying earlier in the the introduction that the Nadia was saying that the, the trauma that can happen in utero or, or at the moment of birth, is something that's with, it, with you for your whole life. So you don't even know what it's like not to have that trauma. But there's just, you know, there's just something wrong. There's just something, everything is disharm disharmonious. 
but it took me, I don't know, you know, 50 odd years to live with that. And, and just by chance, um, during the training, I managed to release that trauma, which is, and it's part of the therapy, which is inner child therapy. So that's when the client is taken back to a traumatizing moment in childhood. And it's usually under the memory, under the conscious memory. Um, and I actually relived my, my birth experience, um, but having been empowered. And that was, are so transformational, so transformational. It was, it was incredible. It, it gave me such an overview of my life and why I've experienced what I've experienced, why I think the way I do. Um, and it also helped me to appreciate, because when you're, as a client, when you're in this work, you're in a trance, you're in, you're in a trance, light trance. And this is where the, the, this is the doorway to the imagination and, and the imagination is the is the road to the soul and the soul memories um, and it's there that all the transformation work can be done and I realized that if I had not had that trauma at birth which was I had the cord around my neck I was born with the umbilical cord uh, mm. and I was actually been strangled to death I was dead when I was born, <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I didn't get that initial spark that when the, this is what I understood in the, in the um, experience was that when the baby's head comes out of um, the, the mother's body and it meets the air of the outside world, and then there's, of course, it slips out. This is that that air is the spark. That's the kind of the god spark, as it was like run turning the engine on, turning the ignition. But I didn't get that spark because I wasn't able to take the breath, which is starts the whole engine running. The body starts to operate in a different way because it's taking in air, which before it was you know attached to the umbilical cord. Um, I didn't get that, and um, and this 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 I. Uh, has affected my whole, and I was smacked by the midwife, that's right, to make me take a breath, uh, which didn't work. And then she gave me the kiss of life. So my entry into this life was was highly traumatic. I, I was dead, <laughs> you know. Um, and I, I, in experience, I remember being in the womb before my birth and it dawning on me of what I had chosen ahead of me. Um, and it was as if I was like trying to back up going, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, I changed my mind. I don't, I don't want to do this. No, no, no. And my mother said I was turning like a crazy thing. And I, I think in my panic about what was going to come, that's when I got um, caught up. But I realized in this experience that if I had not experienced that trauma, I would not be the... Um, I would not have the empathy and the experience to to be as the effective therapist that I am, because you know how how can I how can I how can you help somebody who comes to you with something you haven't experienced? Um, you know you can you can when when you've experienced what it is to have no self worth, to be codependent, to be um, to think you've always done something wrong from being smacked as a baby, to you know not having any trust in life and all these things that can be set off with such a traumatic entry into, into this world. Um, it's, it's made me the person I am, and I'm actually very grateful for the experience now. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's yeah. fabulous, Lucy, thank you. And I, I, I think that's a, a thread when we've had our discussions before today. You know, it is that thing of, it's what builds us as who, into who we are. And that's why I agree with you. I'm, I'm grateful for so many things that have happened, that, which at the time I probably wouldn't have chosen. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it is about making us who we are today and, and what we can now offer, which is fabulous. Yeah. Thank you so much for all of that, Lucy. Um, really welcome. appreciate your explanations and sharing of your trauma. So now we move on to Nadia. So Nadia was a fitness and personal trainer for nearly 20 years who after getting two hip replacements, 
was called to change and become a spiritual energy and movement visionary, guiding people to find their internal bodies, wisdoms and power and heal from the inside out. So over to you, Nadia. Thank you, Diane. And Lucy, you're my sister. <laughs> There's things that have happened to you that I can relate to. And um, unfortunately, not the birth thing, because my mother never really disclosed it, but she disclosed the fact that I was so hairy and I was born uh, premature that she just couldn't relate to me. And she used to put me at the bottom of her bed. I have no idea how my birth actually was. Um, but I also know that um, it set, however, the reasons why I was um, conceived um, might not have been the reasons why one wants to have a baby, basically. And uh, with my mom, she um, she's very controlling. And so that set a pattern for me. And um, so she told my husband this when I was in my 50s. And I didn't come to any of these realizations until I was in my 50s, early 50s. So, it, it, you know, it, it, uh, it's taken me. I've, I've always said that I'm a bit of a slow a slow developer but it it was like okay so how why did this all happen and um she basically and everything that's happened to me now is just a story so you know by doing the work that i've done it's no longer a drama in my tissues i've released it so it's like i'm telling you a story about somebody's experience and so I hope you're not going to get too shocked because I can give you quite a lot of <laughs> shocking stuff. And, but it's okay, it, I'm okay. I'm here to tell you the story. Um, I am in communication with my mother's spirit and, and all of my ancestry. So, you know, in fact, she's here helping and I have asked her to help me, you know, because if this is an experience that I've had in order to help other people, then I'm blessed to have, to have experienced it. So basically, uh, she hired a detective to catch my dad and her in bed so that she could then uh, divorce her first husband, whom she only married because she was very stubborn and, and she wanted to leave home. So that's a story. And um, when then my mother and my father um, divorced uh, when I was eight, that is when my mother then more or less, I felt as a child of eight, I know she no longer loved me. So I remember from that moment onwards, I felt incredibly lonely and very, very lost. And, um, but there was a strength of spirit within me that always caused me to rebel. So I was always a bit of a rebel. So my spirit has taken me through right until now. And then, so, when I was talking about two types of trauma, mine was a soft trauma in that um, my mother was controlling throughout my life with her until I was 21. Um, but for me, it was normal, you know? The only way that she could show me love is by buying me stuff. You know, the rest of the time, she used to hit me around the head. She used to abuse me physically and verbally like I was a piece of filth. And, um, you know, and I could never do anything right. So that is a soft trauma. And when a child can't run away, she or he freezes. You know, you can't run away from your mom and dad. You, you think it's a normal thing and it's, it's part of how uh, everybody is being brought up. And um, so I always learn to stand to attention. And I don't know whether any of you can relate to this, but when you stand to attention, you're really tight. And that tightness um, helps you to seize up in the end. So as you get older, it can cause osteoarthritis. And uh, for me, that's what, that's what happened. So when I was uh, just in my 40s, my early 40s, my doctor said, when I said, oh, I have such a pain in my lower back, what's going on? And she says, you've actually got osteoarthritis in your hip. And I thought, what, you know, here I am an aerobic instructor. They used to call me six pack nad, you know, there was like, I'm tough, I'm not good, I can't get hurt. And um, then fast forward, uh, when I was um, in my, in my uh, early fifties, 
I then had to face the music and decide yes. So 15 years of complete denial, um, I then decided I had to have a hip replacement. Now, during the early 2000s, that's when the transformation started. When I started to wake up is really, it's like a, it was a wake up call. You know, so there I was teaching a really hard fitness um, sessions to people because I was a real hard taskmaster. You know, if I can survive, then so can you. You know, that was how I was. Um, and uh, it actually broke my body. You know, so I, because I'm a Qigong practitioner and I have been for 30 years, I have also learned the philosophy between the two polarities of yin and yang. So I come from a very yang approach to, you know, the tougher I make myself, the less hurt I can be. So that is what, how trauma can affect somebody, you know? And, um, and then when I had my first I went to, um, to a workshop that was run by a wonderful person called Liz Cork from Core Awareness um, in UK. And she works with the fight, flight or freeze reflex, which is held in the psoas muscles. So it's all part of the central nervous system and reflex action. And um, this was in 2004. And um, she was putting music on and we were left to move the way that I'm guiding people now, moving from inside out. That was a completely new concept for me. It was like, what the hell is this? And um, it, something happened, something happened. And I was actually staying with my cousin who lived, this is in, uh, near Kenilworth. And um, at lunchtime, I was able to walk to my cousin's and at lunchtime, and I said, you know what? I said, suddenly I realized why I had had a very abusive relationship. Um, so for four and a half years, the person that I really, really fell head over he heels in love with, he was very abusive. He was very abusive verbally, physically, emotionally, treating me the way that my mother had treated me. But I did never put the two together. You know, it was like, what have I done? You know, what, what, what's all this about? And as I was telling my cousin, you know, this guy, I just felt suddenly really, really violated. I was violated by how I had been treated and how dare he. And so suddenly there was a huge release. And as I was releasing, telling my cousin this, my whole body started to tremble and shake, which was all part of that workshop. The workshop helps people to tremor. It helps people to honor. Uh, their body you know because we can have all this bashing you know when they said um that that saying about uh uh what is it because i'm not really english and i always forget the sticks and stones can can may break, break my bones but words never will but actually words really did you know mm. and um and so that was one release and then suddenly, because I had shaken this out, something that I had already held since 70, 75, you know, came out in 2004. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that was such a complete eye opener for me. And so then I then start, and, and I was already on a journey since um, 97 of trying to figure out how to help myself by helping others as we all do, you know, we think, okay, well, you know, I've got to help people because this is the kind of help I wanted. Um, and during that journey, which started around 97, um, I came across people like Louise Hay and lots and lots of other amazing people. And um, I was very interested in her book, Heal Your Body, Heal Your Life, the two books, and she's written lots of other books. And um, when she said that osteoarthritis is to do with resentment and heavy criticism and all of that, I just at the time couldn't see it. But as a result now, I've written it in my book, my little book, True to My Roots. And I started every chapter as a lesson and I use the cause of what hips do in life. You know, hips is like hip, hip, hooray. You move forward in life. Yeah, but if, you, if you're at the crossroad in your life, you might get stuck and then it will reflect possibly in your hips, which it did with me. So 
you know, all of the um, uh, all of the work that I've done with regards to um, understanding why I ended up with osteoarthritis and it was a long journey. And I think Lucy mentioned something about being in this dark space. I, this went on for me for about 12 years where I really, you know, I, I believed in myself, but there were times when it was really, really tough because having been so physical, I couldn't move anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just very grateful that uh, we live in this era that I could actually have new hips. But, um, one of the things that I will say is that, you know, the, it's really, really important that we connect all the stuff that goes in our head with the body. We have to embody our feelings and our emotions, because if you don't, it, you miss a huge chunk of releasing health trauma. And that is what I'm now guiding people with, because you know, I, I just guide people with releasing and and um, and helping get over health tensions and traumas and everything. And and it kind of it's an ongoing journey, like you all say, you know. And I'm still developing, and I'm still learning, and and I'm welcoming um, the light beings into my life, and and really, really listening. And and um, so it took me that's good. Lovely. It took yes. me instead. Thank you. Yeah, nice. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, sharing your experiences and, and the work that you do. Thank you. And now I'm going to introduce Diane to tell us about what her work is. But unfortunately, I don't have a written introduction for her. <laughs> so I, I can't to send it. it a lot, <laughs> except that she's amazing. Oh, thank you, Nikki Marianne. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in recent times, I've called what I do intuitive unfolding um, because I feel that that's what I've been doing for the last 20 odd years consciously. And before that, it was unconscious, but I was still doing it. Um, and so, yeah. So, so how did I come through to that? Well, when we were discussing trauma in, a, in our group um, before this call, um, I was thinking, OK, so is there something I can share that's OK to share publicly? Because obviously this is going out on Silver Tent TV. And I was thinking something that, you know, certainly had a huge impact on me. And I know it's something that's impacted many people. And that's the breakup of my marriage. Um, and that was a huge shock to me. Um, so this happened in 1998. I'd been with my son's father for 21 years. And all of a sudden, that was it. We'd kind of fallen apart. And I was like, oh, what the hell happened there? You know, and, that, and thinking about it, it was like, you know, an elastic band, you know, where it, you pull it tighter and tighter and tighter. And I didn't notice this was going on. You know, the, this was all unconscious, this tightness and tightness and tightness until all of a sudden one day it just was, there we go, it snapped. And, and that physically hurt. It really did. You know, I felt this real, what, what just happened? I don't understand this. And so the first thing I did, which is very typical of me, was go into my head. And so I started reading books and, you know, books about relationship and, you know, there's some fantastic stuff out there. And, you know, I was reading stuff. It's like, oh, well, if I'd read this book about 10 years ago, it might have saved my marriage, I guess, was one of the responses I had to one of the books I read. Um, and then there was another book that was kind of intriguing and I didn't know that it was what it was at the time. But it was a book I, I later discovered and understood was to do with um, a shamanic tool <laughs> where, where you pull your soul bits back together and, and recover yourself, soul recovery. Um, but I didn't know that at the time. I was just reading this stuff and there was all sorts of things I was going, going through. And then after a few months, I realised that, again, like Nadia spoken about with physical stuff, 
I thought that I've not been dancing. I really want to dance. And it's something that I've always loved to do. And so I rediscovered dancing and I, I found myself a dance class and went off to that and it was fantastic. And just really getting into the physicality of myself and really enjoying that. And, and it was great fun, great fun. Found some lovely people and yeah, learned some new stuff. Never done street dance before and various other things that I did, which was really cool. So had a lot of fun with that. So I was exploring in my head. I was exploring in my body physically. And over the years, I'd learned various tools anyway. You know, my, my son's father was a kinesiologist, so I'd learned a lot of stuff to do with that. I'd learned stuff to do with NLP and Sedona method and all sorts of other things that I'd come across through that. And gradually, I kept unfolding more and more things. So um, I was living up in Scotland when we split up and I decided to make... Um, the leap down to London. There's a whole story about how that came about, but basically my life unfolded into London. So I ended up in South London and I discovered salsa dancing and had a ball in more ways than one salsa dancing. That was so much fun. Um, again, just understanding more about me and including sex and things like that. You know, that was, there was a lot of fun there, you know, because salsa, you dance with a guy, you know, so it's kind of fun. And you can have a, have a lot of fun with all of that. So what was that? So it was going through stuff and I kept revisiting, well, what's going on? What went on? Why did it happen? Why did it happen to me? And all those other things that a lot of us go through when we, when we go through relationship breakup. And, and it was all great exploration. It was great discovery and rediscovery, I guess, with, with all of this. And then... I decided that I needed to understand what path I was on. So like yourself, Nikki Mariana, I discovered I was following a shamanic path. I didn't know that till I read a book, which was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> um, I understand this, Yee -hee. you know, lights go on, you know, as, as other people have said. So that was really cool. So nowadays, what do I do? I help people by walking alongside them as they unfold and helping them to unfold and find what is within and so for me it's about unfolding into the heart of joy and that's that's how I describe it what I do with people and that can be anything from playing a gong to singing a song to using essences, you know, and vibrational things, including other things like crystals and all of these things are possible and all of these things can help. And yeah, I just love having this, what I regard as my um, etheric tool bag that I've put all these things that I've learned over the last 30 or so years into this tool bag. And then I just pull them out as I go and as appropriate and the person will be doing something saying something I'll get a sense I'll get a, a feeling and it's like whoa yes I know let's do this let's explore this and helping them to un unfold into all of that whatever it might be so there you go thank you Diane wow I, mean, I think what comes over to me is that we've all been on huge personal journeys and our journeys have taken us in slightly different directions but all of us have have honed in and focused on the need to be intuitive and mm. to work from the heart as well perhaps as from the mind yeah absolutely I, I absolutely agree with that because that was the the commonality we discovered wasn't it in our conversation although it was trauma that brought us together it was our hearts that bonded us and you know that's that's where where we went with all of that so thank you everyone for listening and for sharing from from the three of you and what i'd like to do now is to open the floor as it were open the zoom room um so sunday um i know you've been keeping an eye on comments um just wondering if there's any comments or questions that anybody's popped up into the chat that we could think about just now um there isn't any questions but marcy okay. has said such holding with all of you beloveds 
truly. So, um, and we've had about, yeah, that's it. There's no, no other comments or questions. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So is there anybody then in the group here? Um, we can open it out to the wider group briefly. If anybody's got anything briefly, they'd maybe like to add. Steph, Steph. would you? Yeah. Um, while I was listening to all of this, I was thinking back to my young life and the various traumas that have happened in that. And it struck me that what I never had as a child was boundaries. What I was never taught as a child was boundaries. In other words, letting an adult hold their own emotional space without me having to rescue them, which was what my job was for my mother. And from that point on, because I had no boundaries and I knew not how to take care of me, um, mm. it's taken years and years and many traumas to get through that. And if you don't have boundaries, then you leave yourself open to abuse from all kinds of directions and you learn over the years and it's taken me 68 years to get there. <laughs> but well, actually putting me first <laughs> is important. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely and well done for getting there at 68 because you know i think there's so many people who never get there not yeah. in this lifetime anyway that you know and and that's fantastic steph yeah so well done feed, you doesn't that feed back into our parents and our mothers and our fathers absolutely. who were in the position where they had to go to war they had to do jobs they didn't want to do um, they were traumatised, their parents were Victorian, they were told what to do, so that feeds down through the generations. So Absolutely. we've got to learn to pass on the look after yourself and love yourself stuff. Absolutely, yeah. I really agree with you there, Steph, because yeah. one of the things that I said, that my body was actually crying out for my own love and attention. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it's never too late. I'm also 68. So don't worry about that. Age is inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> and so. actually, the more that we work with acknowledging, understanding and releasing these traumas, the younger we get, yeah. which may sound silly but we are letting go such enormous loads and stuff and burden that we suddenly find we can begin to breathe again yeah. absolutely yeah i agree with you and finding and would, our inner joy as well we find our inner yes. joy yeah yeah, yeah. And i would add that these days um it seems that we are being uh and I, all of us you know humanity is being um forced to, we're like we're, our, our dark stuff is being purged. We're being forced to look at the, 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 the traumas or the, the, the shadow, let's say, which usually comes from a trauma. Um, we're being forced to look at that. So it's, and it's happening faster and faster. And the more work we can do uh, on ourselves, the, the easier and, and the quicker the collective consciousness can rise. So it's it's valuable valuable work to be tracing our traumas back and um, healing and transforming them. Yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because we tra in transforming each person, each person then trans helps to transform everyone else. Because we're all part of one thing. Exactly. It's all one yeah. web, you know. Yeah. I know we've got the internet, the world wide web, but we've got the cosmic web as well, and we're we're all part of that. And Sunday, you've got something there. Stevie wanted to say something. Oh, sorry, as well. Stevie. Okay, yeah, Stevie. On now. Oh, yeah, I can't find myself now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I don't know where I've gone, but there you are. <laughs> well, if you could. Um, yeah, just to say, um, are you finishing at five uh, in two minutes, by the way? In the next few minutes, it'll be five or maybe just after five, but not long after. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, one of my things I'm recognizing now, a lot of you who know me on there know that I sleep around a lot in the nicest possible way and I you know I, I can sleep anywhere and I enjoy sleeping in people's houses and I sleep better when I'm outside or sleep better when I'm not in the home and one of my traumas that is, keeps coming back to me over the last couple of years is probably the 
the reason for this is I spent a lot of time in and out of hospital from when I was about 14 months old till I was 16 years old in various hospitals. And I didn't really know where my bed was. And also when I did a visualization, visualization not long ago with somebody, uh, and the idea was you go upstairs and you stand on your landing and go into your bedroom. I didn't even know where my bedroom was at home. And when I asked my brothers and sisters, where did I sleep when I was little? They couldn't come up with an answer. So my brothers and sisters can't remember where I slept. So um, much as I like the idea and I call myself adventurous, there's actually a root of trauma as to why I sleep better anywhere else but my, my own home. Um, so that was just an interesting thing. And you, you talked about soft traumas and the shock of trauma. And I think in my case, uh, because I had shocks every time I went into hospital in different ways for different things, and it was ongoing for 15 years, it's a bit tricky because it combines the two, the soft trauma and the shocks every sure. now and again. So, sure. yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to share that. I still don't know where I've got my see myself. But, well, um, you're here. We've heard you, Steph, Stevie, which you. is the important bit. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sunday. Yeah, uh, thank you. Diane Dowell has, has popped up with a little comment that she says, it's interesting this has popped up the evening before I have to communicate to a council about communication. My trauma is about not being heard and how to communicate that. And that also made me think about me being estranged by my adult children and that that sort of sense of powerlessness of, of somebody, the trauma of somebody going and actually not communicating with you, which is a, a tremendous, for me, tremendously powerless feeling when somebody actually won't have a, a communication with you. And it seems that Diana sort of triggered that. Um, she says now that I now take out my frustration and communicate knowing I will be heard. I don't quite know what she means by that, but that's, a comment in the live so thank you for that Diane. Thank you yes okay so we're, we're getting towards the end here um, so um, Nikki, Nadia, Lucy anything else that you'd like to say just now? Um, anything else to add? Yeah, I can totally relate to the comment of getting near birth and thinking actually what have I done? Why have I agreed to be here? I'm not coming out. <laughs> and I know my poor mother went through a huge ordeal giving birth to me. She never told me exactly what, because things like that were not spoken about in our family. That's right. Yeah. Mm. But I, I was the opposite to you, Nikki Mariana. I couldn't wait to get here <laughs> and whoop it up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, there was something else. Um, yeah, Diane's comment about now she expects to be heard. That is really important because if you hold that expectation, that affects every part of you and it affects how your words come over. And that's also been a huge journey for me. It had, wasn't really until I joined Synergy and the Silver Sisters began to hear me and encourage me to speak that I really began to speak up. And actually, I'm older than 68. Not a lot. <laughs> Not a lot older. Only four years. But it's <laughs> never too late to start. Absolutely. And we're all goddesses anyway, so age doesn't matter. <laughs> if there's anything else that somebody particularly wants to say, I'd like to hand over to Diane to close. Um, I think she's going to create some sound for us, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. So... One of the things that I've been doing in recent times is having singing lessons, which was a bit of a challenge last year because obviously I started in December 19 thinking I'd have singing lessons every month and hasn't quite worked out that way due to lockdown, but hey. Um, 
and I wasn't sure, but I, I think I'm going to sing. Um, so if that's okay with everyone, I know some of you have heard me sing this song before, but hopefully you'll enjoy it. But I think on the day of St. Valentine, this feels like a, a, a nice song to finish with. And I love it. It's one of my favourite songs and it's The Rose by Bette Midler. So what we'll do is when Diane finishes her song, we'll just close the meeting and just take those beautiful sounds with you. So just before we do that, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who's been here, people who joined us in the Zoom room, people who joined us on the Facebook Live, and those of you who are going to be watching on Silver Tent TV. And thank you particularly to Lucy, to Nikki Mariana, to Nadia, and to Sunday as well. So thank you so much for being here. And this is, I hope, so long as it will come out, <laughs> the rose. <laughs> Some say love, it is a river that drowns the tender reed. Some say love, it is a razor that leaves your soul to bleed. Some say love, it is a hunger, an endless aching need. I say love, it is a flower, and you, it's only seed. It's the heart afraid of breaking that never learns to dance. It's the dream afraid of waking that never takes the chance. It's the one who won't be taken, who cannot seem to give. And the soul, afraid of dying, that never learns to live. When the night has been too lonely and the road has been too long and you think that love is only for the lucky and the strong just remember in the winter, far beneath the bitter snows, lies a seed that with the sun's love in the spring becomes the rose.